So thank you so much to everyone for joining us for this lunchtime session. Uh, so this is part of a series where we talk to some of our most inspiring alumni from between 2008 to 2010 to discuss how they steered their career through the challenges and difficulties of the last recession. So using examples from their own careers, um, we'll invite them to discuss opportunities that emerge in times of adversity and how to build a resilient practice to ensure longevity and sustainability. Uh, and we're lucky enough to be joined today with uh, Evan Fowles, who is co-founder of Field and Fowles with Fergus Fielden. And um, he graduated in 2009 with Diploma Honours and uh, their young practice has already been shortlisted for the Reba Sterling Award in 2019. Uh, and Evan has developed a range of wide range uh, award-winning projects, so from their own studio in Waterloo to Charlie Bingham's food production campus in Somerset, and most recently uh, Carlisle Cathedral, an extension to Carlisle Cathedral. Uh, he taught and lectured widely, including at the RIBA, uh, University of Cambridge, BAA, and London Met, where he ran a design studio for three years, exploring new forms of education design. Um, my name's Awi Phillips, and uh, I graduated this past summer and uh, we're going to invite people to ask their own questions and um, contribute uh, after Ed's introduced some of his own work uh, through a talk. So if you could uh, either raise your hand and ask in person or you can also contribute to the chat and I will read out your questions. And um, yeah, fantastic. So if I can pass over to Ed. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I was trying to think back to the last time I gave a presentation at the AA. Um, and it was um, certainly the most nerve wracking was probably this occasion, um, or getting on for 10, more than 10 years ago, um, when I presented my diploma project um, at the end of uh, studying my diploma at the AA. Um, I was in DIT 10. Um, and, uh, and taught by Carlos, um, he's with us today. And um, I suppose I wanted to sort of begin this talk by touching on kind of uh, the, the themes and interests that you have as a student and how um, they, they somehow kind of persist with you and stay with you once you leave education and once you find your, your footing in, in the world of work. Um, and my project, um, which I'd just like to touch on briefly at the, at the AA, was all about food urbanism. I was really preoccupied with this idea of kind of how food shaped cities and um, discovered that there were all these food deserts within Hackney. Um, got a bit obsessed with um, kind of the way of kind of judging whether uh, there was sort of healthy food available from um, shops and the kind of shape of food distribution within the city and uh, mapping all of the kind of food outlets within Hackney um, and discovering these areas of sparsity um, for, for access to food and really being kind of quite fired up about this issue of um, big uh, food stores, shops, Tesco, for example, developing, essentially developing our cities for us um, for profit. Um, so the, the proposals that emerged were kind of wide ranging. They were kind of um, more strategic kind of food maps, distribution maps. Um, and uh, I was looking to kind of re-centralize um, food distribution and kind of re-socialize um, and, and make more visible uh, the way that food enters our cities, uh, focusing on kind of Hackney Central and bringing this sort of food distribution hub, which is both retail and wholesale and a range of other kind of, uh, sort of more social proposals in the area. Um, but whilst all that was happening, um, and Carlos will probably remember this well, um, every other tutorial I'd ask him a question about a, a roof detail or a um, flashing detail, because uh, Fergus, my business partner, and I were in the midst of a, of a design and, and build project in Wales. Um, and um, this was going up on site during um, my final year at the AA. Um, it was a passive um, sort of low energy, uh, sustainable uh, timber frame house in, in the Brecon Beacons. Um, and I think this is sort of a very important milestone for Fergus and I. Um, we hadn't really even named our practice at this point as this was happening as we were studying 
um, but it was um, really instrumental um, in the kind of uh, the start of the practice in having a project that we could graduate, leave, uh, leave school with and kind of sell um, as it were to future potential clients. Um, so that, that was really the kind of uh, the founding of the practice was around 2010 when we finally got this building finished and published. Um, and uh, since that point, we, we kind of worked on a number of um, more typical kind of London resi refurbishments. Um, and I suppose um, we, we sort of set up in the pit of the recession and actually, you know, our overheads were incredibly low, both sort of personally and for the business. We were working jobs on the side. And um, I suppose one kind of initial piece of advice I want to impart is about kind of not being too too sort of picky about the sort of work that might come your way um, and really seizing opportunities. Um, so lots of these jobs weren't at the outset particularly glamorous, you know, putting a, an extension on the back of a Victorian terraced house, refurbishing an apartment and so on. But through these um, relatively um, small um, and kind of um, straightforward jobs, we kind of learnt, learnt the sort of challenges of building, uh, learned about the contract, managed to get our part threes, both of us. Um, but um, today I wanted to talk to you really about kind of um, three quite kind of instrumental projects for the, for the growth of our practice. And um, in a funny way, they kind of relate back to this sort of early preoccupation um, that I had during Dip 10 and with kind of food and its relationship to the city and to um, social and community space. Um, so in 2015, we were approached by a couple of charities um, to look at a piece of land which um, is, is incredibly central. Uh, so this is River Thames here, this is Parliament, um, St Thomas's Hospital, um, and there was this sort of very derelict piece of land just um, behind, behind the hospital um, in the middle of Lambeth. And um, surprisingly, given how close um, the site was to Westminster, um, we find that there's this huge inequality. Um, you know, 50% of young people are living in poverty in Lambeth. Um, and there's um, a yeah, much higher chance of being involved in violent crime and so on. And local school that we worked with was called a number of academies and schools in Lambeth. Um, and they um, teamed up with um, a charity called Jamie's Farm as well. Um, and being kind of locked into their kind of inner London sites, um, it was amazing that the, the hospital who owns this land uh, offered, offered them it to um, use for educational purposes. Um, so we kind of seized this opportunity to kind of bring some vision to a, a sort of central London plot for a temporary use. Um, the land was given them to use for sort of five years. Um, but uh, it had historically been kind of bombed in the war and then many kind of uh, temporary buildings um, had been there historically, but then kind of, it kind of fallen into disrepair. And we kind of derived, sort of developed this brief as to how to kind of structure the site and, and create a kind of master plan for the site so it would benefit the most users essentially, not just the schools, but the wider community around the site. And um, food was a good kind of starting point, this idea of turning it into a productive space, um, a sort of city farm, um, but with an opportunity for, for growing space, for, for learning to cook, learning about nutrition, um, but also with a more public facing element, uh, a kind of more social community barn at one end. Uh, so all these ingredients were kind of distributed into um, the site. Uh, so based on this very kind of linear diagram of all the services running down the center and then distributing um, the more public end uh, right at the kind of west of the site here um, and then a more private secluded end uh, and we were, we were doing this work kind of more or less as a favor uh, at the time and um, we kind of realized that in order to make this project happen and help the, the sort of charities raise money to do this project we'd have to get more involved, not less involved. And uh, we offered to, to design the whole site for free in return for being able to build uh, a little studio for ourselves on, on the site. Um, 
And we were kind of very interested in very primitive forms of construction to make it cheap, um, to make it very lean and affordable, um, such as kind of very primitive agricultural kind of bush carpentry. Um, and from this, we derived this sort of language of timber frame structures, um, which could be built very quickly. Um, and the first phase was the animal pens, uh, which was built to kind of enable kids to get to site um, within the first year of the project. Um, but kind of the econ economics of how this all worked um, were quite interesting because um, in order for us to, to make it worthwhile for the practice to be involved, um, we kind of took a real punt on saying, okay, well, um, we'll try and get, get planning permission for the site. We'll do all this work for free. And if we were able to build our own studio on the site, um, we'd have three to five years of occupation on the site for free with no rent. And I'm sure you're all aware of how high rents are in, in London. It's the same for commercial practice, commercial spaces. So we kind of did, did the sums and realized that, you know, if we um, were able to stay here for three years, you know, a building of around 200,000 pounds would, would essentially equal our rent that we'd be paying somewhere else for the studio. So um, there was this sort of interesting economy. We, we ended up borrowing the money to build the studio. And we've now actually been here on the site for, um, getting on for sort of four and a half, five years. And it looks like it'll probably be six the time we're, we're out of here. Um, but what was really kind of important about the whole project was um, the informality of uh, having a place that we could kind of test ideas and test ideas that we could use on um, more conventional, kind of bigger, more prestigious projects. Um, so we were kind of driven by this idea of kind of lean, low tech, Kind of solutions to the site and given the life um, span of the buildings on the site it is only kind of five years or so um, we developed a very simple language and um, the design of the studio was really kind of based on this idea of um, creating quite a blank elevation to the street but then coming through this sort of little opening into a, a really secluded walled garden um, yeah, it was an amazing opportunity to be able to design your own space to work in. And um, one of the kind of really influential spaces for us was the Royal Academy drawing studio with these beautiful kind of top lights. It's quite consistent with um, lots of art studios bringing in very kind of soft, diffuse light. Um, so the building was kind of positioned uh, to the north of the site. Um, incredibly simple plan with a very re repeated structure um, was used um, in order to make it really economical. And then this whole uh, south side of the site was was maximized for um, a kind of secluded wall garden. And there's lots of kind of development. And um, as I said about the sort of idea of using a project, particularly a project that you're building yourself, um, it's one of the best ways to learn. And um, particularly when the practice was actually paying to build this building, we had to make sure that, you know, we could whittle it down as much as possible and make it as lean as possible, but also um, think about how we could maybe dismantle the building as well at the end of its lifetime on the site. Um, so we were kind of interested in the jointing of the timber and um, forming joints that could be easily taken apart again at the end of the, the project's life. Um, so all members were designed to be kind of dismantled and we um, came up with this idea of using kind of stainless steel pins to um, dismantle the connections. This was all prototyped as well um, at a, a friend's workshop down in Devon who eventually built um, the project. Um, and then using very kind of agricultural materials to clad the building as well. So on July, which was about six pounds a square meter um, and very simple approaches. This detail was quite important in that it's much cheaper to put a fixed piece of glass rather than having a casement window, which was openable. But for ventilation, we just had this very uh, simple uh, plywood flap, an insulated plywood flap with a piano hinge, which just hinges up to create passive cross ventilation in the space in summer. Uh, and this was the very affordable um, insulation. So the, the project was actually built by um, Alex, who was one of our first employees and a, and a great sort of friend of the practice who got a bit fed up with architecture and decided that he'd moved to Devon and actually um, set up his own timber framing company. Um, 
So Alex and Jan uh, built the frame. It was all prefabricated down in uh, Devon at the workshop and then brought up to London on the back of a lorry. In, in the meanwhile, we were kind of getting on with pouring a slab on site. Um, the whole frame arrived in, in one drop and went up within a week on site. Just using a, a simple kind of hand crane uh, and three three people to to erect it, and I think this was a really wonderful learning opportunity for the whole practice because lots of our younger team members could get involved in um, in site visits because it was so local to to our kind of existing studio at the time. Um, uh, so they could visit site frequently see uh, the different trades on site um, and really get a, a feel for the, the roughness of construction. And I think as a practice, we've always been very um, preoccupied with, with building and actually kind of making sure that we see our projects all the way through to construction rather than being kind of paper architects who are perhaps more focused on competitions and theoretical work. Um, we think kind of the learning really happens through the making. Um, so this was a, a quick before and after um, of the site, uh, running the services down the center here, and then the eventual garden um, and courtyard space with the studio. I think it's been really kind of transformational for our practice, um, not least in the way that it's improved the kind of well-being of the whole team, having a space um, with sort of generous outdoor space for people to kind of break out into um, this sort of visibility towards nature, animals on the farm uh, has been really important. Um, so this is sort of a, a really key part of the kind of economic um, model for the site was us contributing our time and, um, and expertise for free to the charities so that we could carry out the work on the farm site um, for them for free, help them fundraise, get them planning and so on, and eventually build them um, the farm buildings. So the barn went up shortly after um, the, the studio. And this is really the kind of most public end of the site. Um, and in the past sort of uh, three years since it's been operational, um, there's been all sorts of activities hosted here. We have school groups through the site. Um, well, it, it used to be on a daily basis until um, the pandemic, but, um, and then the, the barn also is an important it brings in a revenue to charity as well because it can also be rented out out of uh, teaching hours for um, all sorts of events we've had art night here farmers markets and so on um, so this sort of sets the scene of um, I suppose the, the practice where we're based now um, but um, the kind of importance of uh, sort of wearing your kind of values and and your kind of um, ideas on your sleeve in terms of where you're based and we've had a lot of clients which come through uh, the studio space uh, and it's, it's wonderful to be able to kind of present to them lots of our kind of principles as architects taking quite a, um, a low-tech simple approach to the way we make buildings and this has trickled down um, into kind of the more kind of public buildings that we've we've worked on. So I'm going to try and race through uh, a couple of projects uh, which are completed now, uh, but which kind of resonate with um, some of the kind of early themes. Um, so more or less in parallel with the work we were doing on the studio, uh, we were approached by this chap, uh, Charlie Bigham. And um, some of you may be familiar with his products. He makes these really delicious dishes, which are in supermarkets, um, not allowed to call them um, ready meals. <laughs> Um, but he uh, had this vision to move his business, a kind of food production business, out of London uh, and down to the West Country. And that was partly to kind of improve the well-being of his staff, partly kind of an economic decision um, because of the cost of keeping a, a big food business in the middle of London. And um, it struck a chord with these sort of, this early interest I had stemming from my diploma project about kind of uh, making uh, food, the food production process um, more humane, I suppose, more social. And um, the sort of typical entrepreneur running a food business would probably just 
employ a contractor to come and build them a big tin shed. Um, but for us, we wanted to try and kind of break down this kind of preconception of just uh, the big kind of king's bank king sort of tin shed and start to look at kind of how to create architecture from that framework or kind of imp an improved uh, quality of life for the 300 staff that Charlie employed. Um, and to begin to form a kind of master plan, not just for the initial phase, which was an 8,000 meter squared kitchen and production building, but uh, three further phases, filling up the whole quarry essentially. Um, so we wanted to avoid, this was actually the outline planning application for the quarry down here, which was a sea of car parks with big tin sheds between. Um, and we were kind of interested in alternative models, um, the Vitra campus where all sorts of different architects were invited to create, um, I think it's a kind of furniture and design focus for these um, factories. But we were keen on, you know, learning from some of our education work and our experiences here on the farm, you know, the importance of having uh, the, the sort of staff linking back to green spaces outdoors and um, food production spaces can be quite uh, unforgiving in terms of being very cold uh, because of the chilled environments and usually quite hermetic and sealed, but we really wanted there to be this sort of connection between front of house and back of house staff, uh, connections back to the kind of activity of the work. Um, so the brief, contained all sorts of different elements and we were kind of thinking about how they could be kind of put together rather than just cloaking them in a big tin shed, uh, but also thinking clearly about kind of well-being of the uh, of the staff and the team. So this was the site I and mean, it's an absolutely beautiful site, completely dramatic um, backdrop. There were no services on site at all. A lot of um, ecology, which um, made it very difficult to develop the site, but also an opportunity to work with in terms of maximizing the kind of green space and actually enhancing what was there. Um, the site was about five miles from uh, Wells, or one and a half miles from Wells. Um, and yeah, about kind of five minutes to walk the length of the whole site. It's so quite a large expanse um, with this huge dramatic topography. Um, so we began to kind of look at models of placements of uh, the different um, production buildings and actually move towards this idea of actually building on as little as possible of the quarry floor, um, retaining kind of half of uh, the quarry floor for, um, for nature, for this uh, wildlife garden, expanding the existing lake um, and shuffling the buildings back into the, the southern hall road um, and keeping as much of the transport sort of out of the site. So there was a sort of zoning of the whole site um, and then sort of really socializing um, in, in terms of putting more of the, the shared programs on the north of the buildings. Uh, yeah, with transport, the heavy goods vehicles all kind of moving along the south of the site. So there wasn't too much sort of overlap between the two. And then potentially this fray of different um, future buildings in terms of uh, a, a cooking academy that Charlie wanted to, to create the gatehouse, other meeting spaces across the site. Um, and we were really interested in learning from the quarry kind of vernacular. So drawing from um, existing kind of uh, quarry building types. This was actually a photograph from the same quarry from Dulcott in the 60s. And we just loved this sort of incredibly honest, articulated forms of all of these different buildings. Um, so we started putting pulling apart the kind of the elements of the brief and putting them back together um, and really trying to get away from this uh, idea of the colossal uh, single story shed, which would have just taken up, um, up most of the quarry floor. Um, so we, we began to look at, could we stack the, the process? Um, so essentially you have goods in, all the ingredients, prep areas, cooking areas, assembly areas, and then packaging and then goods out. Um, but we managed to shrink the footprint right down by stacking some of this stuff, having very high bay storage, having um, more front uh, sort of office space uh, at the first floor and kind of canteen spaces and looking at how we could drop as much daylight in, have as much visibility out of the building back towards the landscape. So we began breaking down this form, introducing um, an array of pictures which broke down the, the sheer scale of the building 
bringing in a lot of um, fenestration and and pulling out some other elements, uh, potentially kind of pavilions for the canteen in the future. Um, and then sort of very crudely kind of placing this arrangement uh, across the quarry site, although we were only looking initially at the kind of first phase. Um, so we were drawing a lot from this, yeah, this quarry vernacular. And again, it kind of, albeit the scale of this project was uh, probably a hundred times the size of our studio in Waterloo, lots of the, pr the principles were, were the same, you know, using as few materials as possible in as lean a way as possible, really articulating every material that you use and it being purposeful um, and nothing being kind of redundant. Um, and the eventual kind of uh, layout of the building uh, of the flow is pretty much predetermined by, by Bigham's. Um, it's a very controlled process. Uh, but then on the upper floor, um, creating the kind of office and social spaces with this erosion of the form with terraces and entrance tower and the future kind of pavilion. Um, and remarkably, it went ahead and got built. Um, so this was probably in year six or seven of our practice. And it was a, about a 20 million pound job. I think our, our biggest previous job to that was maybe two or three million kind of education buildings. So it, it quite dramatically increased the turnover of the practice um, working on this job. And albeit quite a kind of commercial project, there was still sufficient kind of uh, interest in, in the brief and um, the kind of impact that we could have bringing some careful thought and, and um, consideration to the design. Um, but this was, it was such an important project for our practice uh, in terms of its timing, because this project and the revenue that this project produced helped us to, um, to weather the kind of period when we were building our own, own studio here in Waterloo. And these are some of the, the finished pictures. So it's now yet yeah, fully up and running, making lots of delicious food. Um, and some of the kind of internal kitchen spaces and meeting spaces, which have these wonderful views back towards the cliffs. Um, and I just wanted to touch on, if I've got time, one further project, which was um, the Western project uh, for Yorkshire Sculpture Park. And um, I suppose I'm showing you this project as a project which represents sort of a different end of the spectrum, you know, gone from a very self-build, building here at the studio in Waterloo, a more commercial project, which which um, often take a long time. They take a lot of um, uh, kind of labor of love to produce them. Um, but this project was for a new gallery and visitor center at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, um, an absolutely beautiful setting. Um, and the, um, the brief was really to, to make a new visitor center. Um, the existing one was in the north of the site and um, giving access to pr probably only a third of the, um, the whole parkland. And by positioning a new um, visitor center and gallery to the west of the park, it enabled this um, linking up of, of um, the three corners of the park with the long side gallery, the initial visitor center and um, the new uh, gallery building. And we kind of drew a lot from uh, the existing works. Uh, there was an amazing uh, Tyrell sculpture, um, a light work, which had this incredible um, insertion within the old Deer Lodge, dropping light in. Um, obviously home to many Henry Moore sculptures, but also um, land artists' works such as David Nash. And the site actually was um, in another quarry site, um, much smaller, but this depression in the land um, was used to kind of, um, for many of the, the historic buildings on the site, the quarry stone. Um, but the site was a, a gateway site, which really opened up to the wider landscape beyond. Um, and so we began kind of wrestling with the topography again and thinking about a building which was very much kind of embedded in to the topography. Um, a real kind of boundary building um, and drawing from some of the kind of land artists um, work such as Michael Heiser 
um, and his sort of earthworks shifting colossal amounts of, of rock. Um, Robert Morris with um, works like Observatory forming these sort of berms enclosures externally and thinking first rather than designing a building which would be placed on the land actually working with the topography to kind of envelop a space that was suitable for um, the conditions of a gallery and a more open uh, space for a restaurant and um, visitor facilities. Uh, this was the resulting plan. Um, and the gallery space became really embedded into the hillside on the north here. Um, very heavyweight construction, but really using that to its advantage uh, in terms of the environmental performance of the building, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, so we're learning from some of those early um, uh, sculptors work in the 60s and 70s, the land artists, um, we wanted to use material from the site, uh, the aggregates from the site, to form this very striated sedimentary appearance to the approach wall. Um, so this really kind of cradles the building site, um, creates um, really purposeful amounts of thermal mass, which moderates the building's temperature and humidity as well. And then we place this um, very lightweight timber frame, learning from lots of the kind of uh, uh, the work we'd done at our own studio in London. Um, so many of the, the aggregates were local. We did all these tests early on um, and began to kind of refine uh, a strategy for the, the layering of the building. Uh, and all the, the material was mixed up on site, the very low cement content um, concrete. Um, and then poured and struck uh, to form these really kind of playful, undulating uh, and slightly changing tonal qualities to the wall. Um, but going back to this idea of a low tech approach to buildings, we, uh, to, to moderate the humidity of the building, we used these um, unfired clay bricks, which were built into the gallery's walls in these thick uh, retaining walls. And what they do is bring, um, uh, bring air through this matrix of bricks uh, and it, because they're unfired clay bricks, they're hydroscopic, which means they take on moisture when the air is really moist and they, they give it out when it's very dry. And so this actually reduced the energy uh, of the building by about 50% just by placing 10,000 clay bricks in the wall. Um, I say just, that's quite a lot of work, but um, in terms of the ongoing uh, energy use of the building, it really minimized it. And that's sort of brought through the gallery and comes out through these holes, um, which are behind the linings to the gallery space. Um, so I think this is really the kind of the culmination of lots of learning from uh, the work we've done at our own site here in Waterloo. There's lots of resonances um, visually and aesthetically with the timber frame, you know, a lot of the learning from here fed into the timber frame of the Western building. Um, but I suppose the experience we gained from delivering a project like Charlie Bigham's um, of that scale um, really contributed to the professionalism with which we could apply to this project. Um, so this building, um, we're very fortunate, was shortlisted for the Sterling Prize as well. Um, and it's formed a kind of, a real kind of milestone for the practice being our first uh, truly public building. Um, I'll just end with a few pictures of the finished building. And I suppose I just wanted to conclude by um, touching on a few words of advice, really sort of following um, 10 years of practice, um, just over 10 years since graduating from the AA. I think it's really important that you seize opportunities um, when they come along. And quite often things which might feel too big or too challenging to take on um, can often, uh, you know, you have to take challenges and take risks, I think, in order to, to, to move forward. And I think we, we've always probably bitten off a bit more than we could chew at times as a practice. Um, but I think that goes hand in hand with this, this sort of spirit of our practice, which is you can only really learn through doing. And I think, um, 
learning through building is really important, but being aware of um, what you don't know and not being afraid to actually ask all sorts of people for advice. Um, so we have this halo of advisors around the practice. And in the very early days, that began with people like my uncle, Jerry, who was an architect and used to come up with us to Wales to help with that very first project. Um, but it was also people like Carlos, my tutor at the AA, who would help scribble over a, a window detail or, or just, in, just through words of encouragement. Um, so I think it's really important to have an awareness of what you don't know and to, to ask for help and to approach the right kind of advisors. Um, now we have legal advisors and PR advisors and probably 10 or so different people around the practice who we can lean on to kind of ask for advice where we need it. Um, and I suppose to conclude, I would just, um, before that, <laughs> I'd just say it's really important that you kind of, in your professional work, when you leave school, you, you try and um, stay true to your principles. I think that's what kind of drives you on. If you know that uh, there's a kind of an innate interest in the work that you're doing, whether that's sort of thematic or it's uh, more kind of practical, uh, if you're really interested in timber construction, then uh, you probably don't want to work for a big practice like Foster's. You don't do much sort of timber architecture. You know, there's, there are decisions that, that you can make which will help you kind of feel more comfortable in the work that you're doing. And um, certainly for us, we kind of, we, we do have principles and morals about the work that we take on and that we do. And I think it's really central that you stay true to those. Um, and just to conclude quickly, we've done a book about the Western, uh, which I think is available from the AA bookshop. Um, not sure if the AA bookshop's open, but you can get it online, I'm sure, or on our website. Um, but thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ed. Uh, yeah, um, if uh, our audience, uh, many of you now, I think almost 60 at one point, uh, could turn on their cameras uh, if you feel brave enough, and that would be uh, amazing. So I can see all your uh, beautiful faces. And um, yeah, please do uh, ask any questions you might have, um, either by raising your virtual Zoom blue hand or by adding them to our group chat. Uh, thank you so much. That was such an amazing talk. And um, I think it was uh, really interesting to even see your student work in there and, and see the progression of how, as I think you call it, growing your values on your sleeve and how that sort of really continued throughout all of your work. Um, I guess maybe to kick us off, uh, I wanted to ask you about, um, I think, so you, you were working on your projects in the Brecon Beacons while you were already at diploma school. And I think maybe a lot of A students can uh, empathize with the trying to balance pursuing your own projects or quite often unpaid work and things with other things like university or uh, working uh, to keep yourself going. I just wondered if you could talk about how you balance that uh, in your career and how you feel, sort of where's the line that you draw uh, between Kind of following your, yeah, your dream or following the kind of reality of living day to day? Um, yeah, I think that's, that's a really good question. Um, and it's always the, the hardest thing, I think, is getting over that hurdle of um, having a kind of critical mass of work to sort of set up a practice. And it feels like such an enormous mountain for um, anyone with, with the burden of student debt, which I still have from my time um, as a student, uh, believe it or not. And TPREN, I suppose, it was a very um, fortuitous um, job that came along when Fergus and I, um, we just graduated from Cambridge from a part one and a friend of a friend of a friend said, oh, I've got this bit of land, can you just come and have a look at it? And we didn't think it was gonna turn into a real project, but we went up to Wales, had a look at this brownfield bit of site and um, one thing led to another and it was a very slow and uh, organic process um, over about, well, certainly during the whole two years that Fergus and I took off and did our year out, two years out in practice, we were working for, for different practice. I was at Hopkins, Ferg was at Howe Tompkins and there, there wasn't an awful lot of extra work. It was the odd evening and weekends while we we're doing our day jobs. Um, doing a little pre-app, doing a planning application. And um, 
eventually it got planning just as we started at um, our part twos. And um, so during our, my first year of diploma, it was, um, we were detailing it all up and it took us about a year to do that. That's quite a long time. Um, and I suppose we were very lucky that the client um, wasn't in a particular rush, uh, knew exactly what he was doing in terms of taking on unqualified architects and uh, people who might take a bit longer and need to ask for help and support through that process. Um, and really um, kind of supported us and, you know, it's a dream client really. And, and I think um, everyone kind of needs those opportunities, I think. Um, so the project kind of um, was eventually on site during the second year and um, we, were, we were being paid uh, for the for the work, obviously. So I suppose it was a it was a sort of stand in for a more conventional part time job. And I used to work in restaurants and bars and things when I was doing my my undergraduate. Um, but it was it was great to be doing a project that was was actually building something for for a potential future practice um, that we were getting paid for, albeit uh, to a tiny amount. And I think I think during the first year of um, our practice, we only turned over. Um, I think it was fifteen thousand pounds between two people, so not an awful lot of money. But that's why we we're having to work day jobs as well. So I think it's very um, nothing happens instantly or overnight. I think it's about that kind of slow, persistent kind of chipping away at something um, and hoping that eventually it comes off. Mm, I think um, perhaps there's a an element of also self belief in that as well, um, and finding your own confidence, um, whether it's through the people who support you, as you said, or, or within yourself. And I wonder if you ever had a moment where you thought, oh, I now know enough to do something, or do you feel like you're still sort of feeling like that and approach every project the same way? No, I think um, I touched on earlier this idea that you have to seize opportunities and often you kind of bite off more than you can chew. And, um, and it's, it, kind of feels like um, we're still in, in the same situation as we were as 25 year old uh, graduates of the AA trying to do our first building in that now um, the, bu the buildings are so big, much bigger and more complex. Um, it feels just as hard, if not harder, delivering the buildings we're delivering now as it did um, all that time ago. It's just that the, the scale and the types of problems change. Um, I think another dimension um, when you're doing your first project and there's perhaps just yourself or one other person, um, there's an immediacy to the work, like you're doing the work. And um, Berg and I have a real shorthand between us. We're kind of on the same page with things and decision-making is very quick. Um, so there's a, there's a whole side of practice and a burden of responsibilities that doesn't exist when you're you're light-footed and you're just it's you and a client and you're designing something and there's a kind of purity to it which is really refreshing um now we kind of we know a lot more about how to make buildings but the complexity is far greater we're running a practice of 20 people it's not a huge practice but it's a lot of um that with that comes responsibility and um, a distraction, I suppose, from from the um, the work of designing. No, absolutely. Um, perhaps because we're in an AA uh, talk, uh, you could sort of talk about perhaps what you got from the AA as an experience, and uh, maybe this is controversial, but also maybe what the AA didn't give you. Uh, in your education because I think that there are a lot of things that as you said the best way to learn is uh, by doing and mm. um, we all have lots of different routes to the AA through different units and I think um, yeah. Yeah, maybe if you could speak about that yeah well I've talked obviously a lot about um, learning through doing learning through building um, and that's that's always been a passion of mine and of, of Fergus's um, but when I came to the AA, I very deliberately chose a unit that was quite um, different and quite at odds with what I was doing in my evenings and weekends with Ferg doing this building up in the um, Welsh mountains. And um, Carl, working you know, with Carlos uh, in Carlos's studio, 
it just opened my eyes to um, a scale of architecture I'd never even considered coming from quite a kind of building focused part one. Um, and um, some of you may well be in uh, Carlos's unit. I'm sure you're familiar with the terms of um, social and physical structures and trying to understand this uh, complex choreography between the complex world of the city uh, and how it all interacts. And um, it's a perspective of, on architecture which sta has stayed with us all the way through our practice and informs um, probably every single one of our projects. Um, I think the site here in Waterloo is a really good example of that. It's kind of, it's urban, but it's temporary. It's an opportunity for events and for the community come, to come together. The stakeholders are many and complex. Um, and I don't think we would have done a project like this without having that kind of, um, kind of th that, that instilled within us um, or within me from, from that time at, at the AA. So I suppose um, if I hadn't been doing the, the project in Wales, then I perhaps might have been frustrated or, or not feeling satisfied that I was learning enough about building, but it didn't really matter because that was happening elsewhere. And um, I think another very specific skill Carlos was very good at teaching his students was about the art of um, presenting well and concisely and really focusing in on um, the true meaning of things and, um, and articulating yourself. I think that was really important. Absolutely. I mean, I am biased because I look so as a cult of unit last year, but uh, I didn't really see those values of like you continue to be really strong throughout your work. Um, I'm Boris uh, says he'd like to ask a couple of questions, uh, but also says that he's had a problem raising the blue hand. So please let me know in the chat if that's the case. And uh, yeah, go ahead, Boris. Hello, hi, Ed. Um, I just want to ask, just because you briefly touched on your uh, diploma project, and I remember actually Fergus project as well I think it was called academics mm. and it's very complementary to yours I mean they, they look like they almost like it's not not the same but they complement very well together so I was wondering did you use the diploma years as a testing ground for your interest and and let's say um, ambitions for your professional career yeah I mean, absolutely I think um okay. It, it kind of relates to, to the last question as well in that we were kind of fulfilling our kind of need to build and this sort of urge to like see something built uh, with, with the project in Wales. And so when we were, well, Fergus was at the RCA and I was obviously at the AA and um, it's no surprise, I suppose, that we were spending weekends and evenings and you know time together doing planning applications and whether detailing a building and, and talking about our student work. And I suppose the, the sort of shared ideas were kind of cross-pollinating and whereas Ferg's work was perhaps more focused on kind of urban agriculture I was looking more at kind of um, a broader uh, idea of kind of bringing food into the city and the kind of logistics of that and opportunities for making it more kind of social um, and I suppose the um, yeah the farm here in Waterloo where we, our studio space is a kind of real kind of product of that inherent Kind of interest in in kind of food and food as a way of um, um, as a kind of attractor and uh, as an opportunity for education and you know it's it's central to so many things. Cool. Uh, yeah, I guess it was. Uh, um, I don't know. It was, I thought it was such a coincidence before, you know. And uh, actually, when students come to me um, and ask about, you know, I would like to set up my own practice, and I always mention actually Fergus, but for um, those people that actually build almost a part two mm. project, you know, that kind of bring the part two project forward. And so that was really interesting seeing. And um, I think following up from that. It's about how to find a very good business partner. Yeah, that's a that's a, <laughs> that's a challenge. <laughs> but you know, I suppose with Ferg and I, we were fortunate to kind of meet uh, very early on in our part one, in our first year at part one. And actually, the first conversation we had was about bikes, not architecture. We were both really into cycling and just had sort of shared passions about kind of um, the outdoors, I suppose, and cycling and. And then the architecture kind of followed. And I think um, it's probably more important. I don't, I don't think we were as aligned in terms of our architectural styles or interests at the time, 
but because our values aligned and what we wanted to do in terms of a kind of more humane, more social kind of architecture, um, very much sort of linked back to kind of the materiality and um, I suppose a more ecological approach to, to making buildings. Um, all those values chimed so well that kind of um, there was sufficient difference in us to, to give us sort of this kind of tension as well. And we were kind of quite happy to kind of uh, argue and, you know, have a tussle about sort of certain early projects. And um, so I think in terms of finding a suitable partner, um, probably it goes the same for romantic relationships too, but um, there needs to be, I think, sufficient complementary skills and sort of difference. But then ultimately you need to be kind of aligned and you know, your heart in the same place in terms of the type of work. You can't be pulling in diametrically opposite directions but some tension is, is quite healthy, I think, for a really good creative process. And last question, uh, what were the setbacks at the beginning of your kind of uh, practice life? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, I suppose we had um, this very initial quite steep curve of growth. Um, after we finished TPREN, we got a clutch of projects, maybe four or five, gradually kind of built up. And we took on sort of, by, by the end of the second year, we had sort of six or seven people. Um, and then lost a couple very sort of overnight and had to shrink right back down again to kind of three or four. And that was a real blow, actually, and, and one that you know, we've not had to shrink dra dramatically like that um, since then. And it's just not a very nice thing having to to have conversations with people saying, you know, there's no more work, we can't employ you anymore. Um, and you're letting two or three people go. So that, that was a real setback. And it, I don't think it was anything that we could have necessarily avoided. It just sort of funding wasn't in place for jobs or, you know, the, the, the political will changed on a couple of things and uh, overnight you can lose work. But I suppose it's um, important just to stay positive. <laughs> I mean, I think generally Ferg and I are quite optimistic all the time and, um, yeah, kind of knew that it it would be a minor setback for a few, for a year or so, maybe, and we'd we'd gradually find other work to fill the gaps. But often, I think, you know, looking on the kind of positive side of that sort of situation, it probably allowed us to become smaller and leaner as a team. And I think uh, shortly after that, we won our first education job. So it kind of made space in the practice to actually have the focus to win a kind of a better project. Than, than the sort of residential ones that we've lost. Um, yeah, yeah. So I just remember one last question. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned about uh, balancing working in a practice uh, and then working on your own projects. I'm sure there's a lot of students and recent alumni that uh, would like to take that on board you know, in the future. Uh, what would be the best advice to give them um, like working in whatever small big practice and then at the same time maybe working with someone else on their own on a competition or on a small project what, what do you think would be sort of the best way yeah. to approach I mean I think um what's important is sort of uh your employer you know the practice that you're working with knowing that um and being content with you doing this stuff on the side and I remember going for interviews after my part one and explaining that um, I was doing this other little project on the side and, and presenting it in a really proud way saying, oh, look, I've got, we've got this project. We're going to go in for planning. And um, there were one or two practices I won't name who were like, well, we'd like to take you on, but you can't do that project on the side. And um, Hopkins were the opposite uh, where, where I eventually worked for four years. And they were really supportive. They were like, oh, it's a great building. You know, what an opportunity. We love the design. You know, they were, they were really complimentary and supportive. And it just, it, it, it kind of, I perhaps could have worked for another practice and done it sort of sneakily on the side, but it was so nice to go into a practice and be, being really open about it and being able to talk about it. And eventually, um, you know, even Michael Hopkins gave me a couple of design reviews on it. I mean, it was amazing how supportive um, they, they were about it. So. I suppose that comes back to that point I made earlier about knowing what you don't know and being happy to and I've asked people, you know, I'd have people around me I could turn around and in the evening be like, oh, I'm just trying to sort out this bloody, you know, window detail. Can you, can you have a look? Great. Thank you very much. That's it for me.
Thank you, Grace. Um, just uh, in the chat, Paul Henderson says, just want to say thank you for the insight into how you entered into practice and found direction to meet topics that inspired you. Uh, and I think that really echoes uh, how a lot of us have felt. Um, yeah, if you want to add, I think it's our last call for any questions in the chat. Um, and maybe I can ask uh, or more about so there's the reason why we're here on Zoom. And I know that this series was based around our last recession uh, and perhaps the opportunities that might have come through that to do sort of alternative things. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you feel that there are any opportunities of today? Um, after all, there is a lot more flexibility and, and sort of working practices are changing uh, through lockdown. And I wonder if uh, yeah, you can see anything yeah. sort of more hopeful. Yeah, well, I suppose... Um one opportunity, a sort of general opportunity when there's a recession is that bigger practices um, that aren't as strong collapse and it kind of opens up the market for new, newer businesses, more progressive businesses to kind of come through as a sort of a generalization. But um, that doesn't really, doesn't really have an impact on a kind of a graduate trying to start a practice. Um, but it helps practices of our scale because um, uh, in, a, in a sort of global recession, you know, we're a bit lighter and agile than, than the bigger um, practices with huge overheads and so on. But in terms of the impact it can have starting up, I think um, I see a current likely outcome of the pandemic being there's a lot of very cheap space available, um, hopefully in London, and um, I think that's always been a really important uh, part of the growth of our practice is having a good space to work from. Um, slightly antithetical to the whole kind of online working situation, but um, I think it's always you know, from from 2010 we had our first studio, and it, it was just a game changer. You know, having a space there we could make models and we could pin stuff up, and I think our architecture has to be collaborative and it, it's a lot harder doing that um, virtually. I think m most areas of our projects have continued fine um, on platforms, but the design process, the kind of early stages, I think are really tricky when you need to have those long open-ended conversations to kind of tease out all the issues on a project. So I think space, I think is the biggest opportunity, like physical space. Um, and hopefully in a year's time, there'll be tons of cheap space that um, young graduates can take advantage of. Um, and yeah, hopefully kind of use that as a, as a benefit their growth. Uh, I think we have one uh, sort of more specific question about um, your projects from Doga. Uh, I don't know if you want to go on camera uh, or should I just, I'll, go, I'll, go, I'll, I'll read out your question very quickly, sorry. Um, so a question about both sites, the Charlie Bingham and the Western being quarries. And was that uh, a coincidence uh, or they, are, they, are they just good bases for building? Are they good? Uh, I'm reading that for interesting um, I think I think it was purely coincidence, but um, quite a useful coincidence because there are lots of the kind of themes um, translated across uh, the two projects. Um, I think qu quarries are quite often development sites because they're kind of brownfield. Um, they've been altered by in industry, obviously. Um, so they make quite good sites. And I think, I suppose the approach to the two buildings was very different, very different scales. Um, but in both sites, we were trying to draw tonally from the quarry kind of vernacular and from the qualities of the stone and the kind of colours, kind of natural pigments and colours um, of the aggregates in, in both of the settings. Um, but yeah, great opportunity if you can if you can build on a quarry, I think, <laughs> and there's stone available, um, more to the point, I think that's, yeah, really good. Fantastic. Um, okay, I think that's about all we have time for. Um, thank you so much for talking about your projects and it was so inspiring to hear about your really humane approach to design, how you maintain that through all of your projects, even as you've grown as a practice. Um, so yeah, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much and uh, hope to see you in the AA building. <laughs> <laughs>
Great. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.